a lot of people are still questioning why Panasonic is still um, heavily focused on the DFD technology while almost all the competitors is using hybrid uh, face detection and contrast detection system. あの、私いつも社内のメンバーにも言ってるんですけれども、オートフォーカスはどの手段を使うのではなくて、に、あの、実際に取ろうってるお客さんが取りたい被写体にですね、素早く正確に合わせる。これが全てですから、私はどの方
Third thing, Panasonic has also announced a new 14 to 28 f4 to 5.6 macro lens. This is an affordable compact ultra wide angle lens that can also be used for a bit of close up or semi macro photos. I did play with a pre production sample for about two days when I was in Japan, and I have to say, so far, I find the image quality pretty good, and I really like how compact the lens is. It's pretty much the same size as the current f1.8 prime lenses, maybe even a little bit shorter, and it has has a fun filter thread as well. But I will need to wait until I properly test it, then I will share with you my thoughts and test results. So if you haven't subscribed yet, you should subscribe to this channel so you won't miss my review. Now, because this camera actually has so many new features and changes that I want to talk about in this review, and I've done tons of testing over the last month, so I've created a number of separate videos that focus on a few special features of this camera, which I will show you more and longer uncut version of the test results that I can't fit all into this review and a few more in-depth discussions as well. So if after watching this review, you're interested to find out more about some of the new features, please check out those special videos that is also available on this channel. And one last thing, I want to say a big thank you to Auckland Camera Centre again for loaning me some camera gear for the comparison test I did in this review. So go check out their website, I got a link in the video description below. Okay, now we can start the review and let's start with the things that you guys are most interested in and that is the new autofocus system. So finally, Panasonic has added PDAF face detection to their autofocus system. You can call them stubborn for keep focusing on and trying to improve their DFD contra based solution for such a long time. Or you can call them listen to their customers and making a dramatic change to their autofocus technology. But this is not the first time that Panasonic did some dramatic change to their core technology. Back when Micro Four Thirds was first started, Panasonic come pretty rely on optical image stabilization system. But later on, when Panasonic released the GX7, it became their first camera that has in-body image stabilization. And then with the GX8, it introduced dual IS that the IBIS and lens optical image stabilization system work together. And now Panasonic has one of the best IBIS system in the market. So in some way, it's not entirely surprising that Panasonic finally added PDAF face detection to their autofocus system. And just like when Panasonic implemented IBIS and mix it with their OIS, Panasonic is doing the same thing again with this new autofocus system. The new PDAF system will work together with their DFD contrast-based autofocus system, which to be honest is not really surprising. All the camera companies' autofocus system is some kind of hybrid system using both face detection and contrast detection as each system does have its own pros and cons and there are some certain things that will rely on one of these systems. So by using the two AF systems together, it should at least in theory give you the best results. So the Lumix S5-2's autofocus has 779 phase detection autofocus point that goes pretty much from edge to edge. That is 20 points more than the Sony's A7 IV. And there are 315 contrast DFD AF points that both work together. Okay, so I guess you guys probably don't want to hear too much about the specs and just want to see some actual performance. And let's start with the video continuous autofocus first. After all, that is the biggest weakness of the previous Panasonic cameras. When shooting video, the continuous autofocus performance of the S5 II is good. And I mean really, really good. When I compared it with the original S5, the difference is pretty dramatic. These two side-by-side -side video were shot with the same Lumix 51.8 lens at f1.8 and 24 frames per second, which is not the best for the DFD autofocus system. The S5-2's autofocus is much, much faster, and yet it is still very reliable and very smooth. I don't really see any pausing at all, and this is the performance that I have been waiting for so many years doing all those autofocus tests in my garden, and 
this Panasonic Lumix S5 II finally delivers that. During the Lumix event, I talked to some other reviewers who shoot primarily with the latest Sony camera like the a7 IV or a7S III and I asked them what they think about the S5 II's autofocus system and the answer was pretty much along the line of yeah, it seems really good, probably as good as their Sony. Some said maybe slightly better and some said maybe slightly worse in some area. But I guess it's fair to say that the general feeling is S5-2's autofocus system appear to be very similar to the latest Sony camera. But of course, to know if the S5 II is really as good as the latest Sony or other cameras, we have to do some side-by-side -side tests and that's exactly what I did. So I've done some tests against the Sony a7 IV and the Canon R6 II. These are the latest full-frame cameras from Sony and Canon that is closest to S5 II in terms of specs and price. Having said that, both the Sony and the Canon are still 25% more expensive than the S5 II. But I don't think it's fair to go back to the cheaper a7 III or the original R6 as both of them are quite a bit older. So anyway, the first test, S5 II versus Sony a7 IV, both have a 50mm prime lens mounted on it. For the Lumix, it is the Lumix 50 1.8 and for the Sony, I could have used the Sony 50 1.8 for this comparison test but that lens is quite old and its autofocus is slow so it's not really fair if I choose that lens so instead I choose the much newer but also a lot more expensive Sony 50mm 1.2G Master lens instead but of course I stopped down the G Master to f1.8 so we have the same depth of field for both camera one more thing I want to mention is that I did reset all the settings on all the cameras to default before I do all these tests so all these comparison tests were done using each camera's default settings with no adjustment at all. I think the performance is very similar between the S5 II and the a7 IV. There are some small things that maybe Sony does a little bit better but there are also some area the Lumix is slightly better. So overall I would say they are so similar even with this controlled side by side test and what I'm showing you is just one run of the test I did. I did a few run of tests and every single test gave me pretty much the same result. So in practice I'm confident to say that there is virtually no difference at least for this type of video. Next I tested against the Canon R6 II. My original plan is to use the RF50 1.8 lens because well it's the same aperture it's also quite new but the RF50 1.8 autofocus is also a bit slow and once again I decide to go up the range and choose the RF50 1.2 L instead. So it is a much more expensive lens and once again I stopped down the lens to f1.8 when I did this side by side test. This time we have some interesting results. When I jump into the scene from the side, the S5 II managed to focus on my face quite a lot faster and consistently faster as well. When I first saw the results, I thought I must have done something wrong so I immediately reset all the settings on both the R6 II and the S5 II again and then I redo the test but the results from my second and third round of testing was pretty much exactly the same. S5 II would usually just lock on my face a lot faster. Now I'm not too sure if it's because the RF50 1.2L lens maybe its autofocus is also quite slow but I did notice when I leave the frame the Canon can snap to the background pretty quickly faster than the S5 II. The S5 II would take about half a second longer before it would focus on the background so the Canon 50 1.2L's autofocus speed is not really slow at all. By the way, the Lumix appears to be always take a little bit longer to focus onto the background when the person in the foreground disappear. Even when I compared to the Sony, it was pretty much the same. Now, since the Lumix S5 II does manage to detect and move the focus to the foreground as fast or faster than all the other cameras, I have a feeling the engineers at Panasonic purposely delay the focus to background changes to minimize some erratic changes. So if the person it was tracking suddenly disappear, instead of just snap to the background immediately, it would just hold there for say half a second or so longer to make sure the person wouldn't suddenly reappear, then it would focus to the background. 
Now, of course, you could adjust the autofocus setting in the camera manual if you want the system to be more or less responsive. But all the autofocus tests that I do on this channel are pretty much always using the default settings as I primarily want to compare each camera's behavior straight out of the box. If I do change the AF setting for some particular test, I would state it explicitly. Another thing I noticed in this side-by-side -side test is the focus breathing from the Lumix is a lot less noticeable when compared to the Sony and Canon. It's not that the Lumix has no focus breathing, it still has a bit, but it is definitely much better and it really shows a major difference in the lens design philosophy. Lumix has a much stronger video focus design philosophy and they try to make all their L-mount lenses to have very minimal focus breathing, while Sony and Canon instead offer digital correction option for people who want to shoot video and hide the distracting focus breathing effect from their lenses. One more thing I want to mention is that with all these comparison autofocus tests, the S5 II was using pre-production firmware 0.74, while the Sony and Canon both using the latest firmware available on their official website. So what about the autofocus performance when shooting under low light? To test that, I did some indoor tests in my living room. So I turned off most of the lights, so it was pretty dark. My face was quite a bit underexposed as well. I locked the shutter speed at 150 second and the aperture is f1.8. Auto ISO is enabled for all the cameras, so I just let the camera to control the exposure itself. And the result was pretty similar between all the three cameras. The detection and the actual tracking works well on all these three cameras. One thing I did notice is my face was quite a bit underexposed in all the tests but my face was underexposed the most with the S5 II, even though I've already enabled the face priority in multi-metering option on the S5 II. I'm not too sure if it's due to I'm using a pre-production firmware, so I would definitely want to test it again in the future with the release firmware. But apart from the S5 II is a little bit more underexposed, the autofocus performance is pretty much the same as the other two cameras. I also did a lot of vlogging style autofocus tests when I was in Japan and also after I'm back in New Zealand using a few different lenses, the 2060 kit lens, the 24 f1.8 and 18 f1.8 lenses. I primarily want to see whether the autofocus system is stable enough, would it get distracted by the background and would it drift to the background randomly. So I did many run of testing under many different lighting conditions daytime with bright sunlight, nighttime at pretty dark places, and also when there's strong backlight. I'm glad to say the autofocus system is just really reliable. Even when I was wearing a mask in Japan, the camera can still detect my face and the autofocus would just lock on my face very reliably. With all these vlogging tests I did, there were only a few very brief moments that the focus would drift away very, very slightly, but that would last less than a second and recover pretty much immediately before the focus drift too far away. So to me, this is definitely as good as the camera from any other system I've used so far in terms of stability when shooting vlogging style video. And I also shot quite a bit of video with my family when we went out during the Christmas period. Yes, it's summer here in New Zealand. So yeah, we went to the beach during the hot summer Christmas here. But anyway, yes, the detection and the tracking works very well even when we are walking and shooting with a 50mm f1.8 lens at f1.8 using human detection. As long as the camera can see the person in the frame, it can detect it and focus on it very quickly and stay focused on it. If you want the camera to detect and track a human subject when shooting video, there's one very important setting I want to explain to you first. Now, let me jump to my garden and I'll show you that now. So if you are shooting with the Panasonic Lumix S5 Mark II, in the camera's settings screen, the detection subject, you can choose between human or face eye detection if you want the camera to detect and track the people that is in front of the camera. So you may wonder what is the difference between these two modes and which one is the one that you should choose. So 
Let me do a quick example and explain to you so that you understand which is the mode that you should choose. Right now, the camera is set to face and eye detection. So I'm in front of the camera, the camera can see my face and eye, so you should be able to detect it. And the autofocus will try to lock on my face and eye and follow me. Now, if I turn my face um, to sideways or turn it around, the camera can no longer see my face. And what it does now is that it will try to detect and track the subject that is closest to the camera within the autofocus area that you selected. Right now, I select the full autofocus area mode. So it will find the GH6 and it will lock the target, the autofocus target onto that camera. And if I turn around, it can see my face and eye. It will then change the autofocus back to my face and eye. Okay, now I've changed the setting to human detection mode. And with the current distance that is pretty close to the camera, so the camera can see my face and eye, it should be pretty much identical to what it does when I was in the face eye detection mode. But if I now turn my body around and the camera can no longer see my face, but now in the human detection mode, it should now track my head position and follow my head instead of trying to just focus on the closest object, which is the GH6. And if I move further away, so the camera can no longer track my head, it will switch to tracking the body and the camera will still follow the position of my body as I move around instead of just trying to focus on the closest uh, object in front of the camera. And as I move back to closer to the camera, it will then switch back to head and face and eye detection. So this is the difference between the human detection and the face eye detection. Panasonic recommend us to use the human detection because it is more reliable, it works no matter how close or far away you are from the camera. So this is also the uh, autofocus mode that I would use when I want the camera to track a person that is in front of the camera. If there are multiple person inside the frame and you want the camera to follow just one of the person as you move around, you can choose the full area AF mode and then either tap on the screen or use the joystick to select the person that you want the camera to follow. And the camera would do a reasonably good job following your subject. However, I find sometimes the camera would still switch to another person, at least with the default AF setting. Fortunately, it doesn't happen very often and I can quickly just tap on the screen if that happens. So it's not really a big issue. The S5 II also has animal detection. Panasonic hasn't said if there's much improvement in the animal detection area. From what I can see, it seems to work quite similar to the original S5. So it works with most common animals like birds, dogs, cats, but it's not the most sophisticated animal detection system. And if you have a very busy background, it may not be able to detect the animal. So I would like to see some improvements in animal detection or in general expand the detection system so I can detect more kind of objects, for example, things like cars or bike. And another thing I would like to see is ability to have more control on what I want the camera to detect or not. For example, right now with the S5 II, if you want to detect animal, you have to choose human and animal detection. There's no animal only detection option, maybe because, well, human is animal after all. But if, for example, I want to use animal detection to help me take photos or video of a dog, but not its owner and not some random people walking in the background or foreground, I can't get the camera to just detect the dogs or just detect animal, but not human. I think as Panasonic improved their detection system and can detect more different types of animals and objects, ability for the user to turn on and off some certain type of detection would be really beneficial. What I mean is, I still want to have some easy option like detect human and animal, that is good, but some extra options for user to fine tune what they want to detect and what not would help a lot of users as well.
One of the autofocus mode that I find works really well is the tracking mode. When in video mode, I just need to point the camera to the subject I want to track and just need to tap on the screen or half click the shutter and the camera would now try to track and follow the subject for me automatically and it works quite well. And if I'm shooting photos, which I will talk about a little bit more very soon, I just need to half click the shutter and the camera will try to track and focus on the target that I'm pointing to. Even if the target goes outside the frame briefly, the camera still can pick it up again when the target reappears inside the frame. Okay, next, what about the autofocus performance when shooting photos? Does the new autofocus system benefit photographer as well? A short answer is Yes, it definitely does. When shooting in AFS mode, single autofocus, the difference is not really obvious. The DFD system does a pretty good job on the previous Panasonic camera. So for most situations, previous camera like the S5 works pretty okay. And I myself have shot a lot of weddings and events using the S1 and S5 with pretty good results. However, under more tricky situations like when there's strong backlight, the main subject is quite underexposed. The previous Panasonic cameras that rely solely on the DFD system, the autofocus may hunt a bit or in the worst case would fail to focus on the subject. But now with the S5 II, it seems to be able to handle it quite a bit better even when there's strong backlight and your subject is underexposed. But I would say the biggest improvement is the continuous autofocus mode, AFC mode. Now, if you are someone who usually don't shoot in the continuous autofocus mode, you probably should still listen to what I'm going to say. With the previous Panasonic cameras, I also rarely shoot in continuous autofocus mode, partially because quite often there is a bit of pausing in the background when shooting in AFC mode. That could be a bit distracting, especially when you are shooting with a fast lens. And overall, I just don't feel AFC mode on the previous Panasonic camera would give me better results than single autofocus mode when shooting static or slow moving objects. But with the S5 II, the background pausing is completely gone when shooting in AFC mode. And if I use human detection mode, the camera will just follow my subject pretty much instantly but more importantly, very smoothly and there's no random pausing or hunting at all. When I was in Japan, I was actually shooting in AFC mode for a whole day without even noticing that because the result was just so good and reliable and I have none of the downside that I usually have with the previous Panasonic camera when shooting in AFC mode. So yes, if you are a photographer and got your hands on the S5 II, definitely give the continuous autofocus mode a try, even if you usually just shoot static or slow moving objects. The only time I find single autofocus mode that still works better is when I'm shooting under very low light, when your eyes can only barely see the subject. Under those situations, AFS mode just still works faster and more reliable. However, if you choose to shoot in AFC mode, and if the camera find is just too dark, it would also automatically switch to AFS mode itself, so it will still work in the end. When you shoot action, the continuous autofocus mode works pretty good as well. Speed and the success rate are both noticeably better than the S5. I shot this sequence of my son running towards me with the 70 to 200 f4 lens at f4, and the result is very good. And I want to share with you one more photo sequence. Now, even I'm not a bird photographer, I can tell you these photos really are not that good. The angle and the pose of the bird are just not ideal. But the reason I want to share with you is, as the camera is panning, there was some really strong reflection from the sea in the background. With the previous Panasonic cameras, that could really upset the DFD autofocus system. But the S5 II managed to follow my subject pretty perfectly this whole photo sequence. But I do find when I try to shoot some birds in flight sequence using animal detections, sometimes the result could be a bit of hit and miss. I feel one reason is that while the animal detection works, 
is not always super consistent. The camera may be able to detect the bird for a while and then it may lose track of the bird later on which caused the camera to look for something else to focus on suddenly. I also find the camera's default AF setting is not really tuned for very fast action. So I tried to change the autofocus setting to the set free and use the zone AF mode without animal detection and that really improved the results from the S5 too. I got much better success rate even if the bird moved quite quickly in front of me. It is still not perfect. When tracking fast moving subject, there would be time when the camera would still fail to follow my target. But luckily, quite often, the camera would be able to refocus on the subject quite quickly, even when there is some pretty busy background. I will talk a bit more about shooting photos in burst mode later on in this review. But the bottom line is, I think the photo mode continuous autofocus still has a little bit room for improvement but for most everyday usage and consider the price of the camera, it is good enough and a very big improvement compared to the previous Numix camera, especially under tricky situations. There's one more thing about the autofocus I want to talk about and that is with the Sigma MC21 adapter. My regular viewer may remember I reviewed this Sigma MC21 adapter which is for adapting Canon EF mount lenses onto a L mount body. When I did the review, I found that it didn't support continuous autofocus for both photo and video mode. So it's not really good for video shooter that rely on autofocus. But now with the S5 II, probably because of the new autofocus system that add the PDAF face detection, you can shoot in continuous autofocus mode that is for both photo and video. And I've done some quick tests using a Canon EF50 f1.8 STM lens paired with the MC21 adapter and my video autofocus test results were surprisingly good. Apart from the Canon lens itself is really quite noisy in terms of the autofocus motor. The autofocus performance is very good. It's very fast, human detection works and the focus transition is also pretty smooth as well. I was totally not expecting that but yes, it means if you have a bunch of Canon EF lenses, you could use them on the S5 II and get very good continuous video autofocus results as long as you don't mind some of those EF lenses that has pretty noisy autofocus motor. Unfortunately, due to the time constraint, I didn't really test autofocus with this combo in photo mode apart from a few quick photos. So maybe if any of you have a chance to try that, let me know the results you got. In case you are worried if the current Elman lenses would work or not, for the Panasonic Elman lenses, I have tested with most of those and yes, they all work perfectly. Some, they may require a firmware update my understanding is mainly for the zoom lenses to be able to work nicely when you are zooming and also doing continuous autofocus at the same time. And if you're wondering what about the autofocus performance when you using the S5 II with one of the Sigma Elman lens, I did borrow a Sigma 100 to 400 lens for one day when I was at the Lumix event, but I end up have only shot less than a hundred photos and I didn't really get a chance to shot any video. So all I can say is photo seems to work fine and I myself have not encountered any issues. But I did notice the autofocus was not super fast, but it could be more to do with the lens itself. I really have to test it more later on when I have a chance to share with you guys my thoughts. If you still want to learn more about the autofocus performance of the S5 II, I have a separate video with longer uncut version of my autofocus test results. And if you are enjoying this video so far and want to support me, I haven't got any affiliate link on this video. So please just give this video a thumbs up or drop a comment below and share it with your friends. So a video from a small channel like mine can do better on YouTube. I've really spent a lot of time to create this video and I don't have a team to help me. So I did pretty much everything all by myself. So I will really appreciate your support. 
Okay, now we have talked about the things that you guys are most interested in. And let's go through all the other important stuff one by one. And let's start by talking about the camera design first. While the camera may just look like the original S5, there's some really clever but hidden design that you may not really notice and nobody has done it before. The Lumix S5 II has a magnesium alloy body and it is dust and splash resistant but it is not freeze resistant. If you put the S5 and the S5 II side by side, they look very similar in terms of design and also the dimensions. One of the easiest way to tell the difference, well apart from looking at the S5 II badges, the camera strap attachment is changed to a new design. With the original S5, there's a metal piece that is attached to the body which could create a bit of noise when you are moving the camera. So it's not really a problem for photographers, but for videographers, noise is not good. So this new design should eliminate that problem. However, when I was using a peak design strap with the S5 II, there were a few times that I suddenly can't turn the rear control wheel on the camera. Turns out the anchor link of the peak design strap was jamming the rear control wheel. So I have to move the strap a little bit to unjam it. But the funny thing is, I still really haven't figured out why or how it happens because when I try to intentionally make it happen again, I just couldn't do that. But then it definitely happened to me more than once. If you're using a normal strap like the one that came in the box, then it should not be a problem at all. The other noticeable difference between the S5 and the S5 II is the shape of the top area where the Lumix logo is. With the S5 II, that area extrudes quite a bit more to the front and a little bit bigger overall when compared to the S5. I believe there are two reasons why the area is quite a bit bigger. I will explain the primary reason very soon. But the secondary reason is probably because the S5 II has a higher resolution 3680K 120Hz OLED electronic viewfinder. Very similar to the one that is on the GH6. I know a lot of people who want a S5 and end up getting an S1 just because they prefer the larger and higher resolution EVF on the S1. So while this new EVF on the S5 II is still not as high resolution as the EVF on the S1, it is definitely a very noticeable step up when compared to the original S5. Apart from these two more obvious changes, S5-2's body design, dials, buttons layout are largely the same as the original S5. It's not a bad thing though because I really like the design of the original S5. It is quite compact but it still feels very comfortable when you hold it even with a larger lens attached to it. The overall ergonomic design is great so I'm happy to see Lumix keep it largely the same. But if you look a little bit closer, then you will still notice there are quite a few smaller changes. If you look at the camera from the top, S5-2's grip may look quite a bit bigger than the original S5. But actually the difference is just the very top of the S5-2's grip is a bit wider to give you better support. The actual grip area that you are holding is pretty much exactly the same size as the S5. The angle of the shutter button also changed slightly. The eye sensor on the EVF is moved from the bottom to the top so it won't get triggered accidentally so easily. The diopter adjustment knob on the EVF is now changed to a slightly smaller one that is sitting behind the eye cup. So it should be harder to accidentally change the diopter setting when you are carrying the camera. The joystick is slightly bigger but more importantly it is now a 8 directional one so you could move the air pawn diagonally instead of only able to move it vertically or horizontally. The LCD screen has the same frippy 2T design just like the S5 and the spec seems to be identical to the S5 as well. When I have the S5 and the S5 II side by side, the LCD screen look pretty much the same to me. However, when I was doing some side by side autofocus tests with the Sony a7 IV and the Canon R6 II, I set the LCD screen brightness to maximum on all the cameras because I want to record the screen on a bright sunny day. Then I notice S5-2's screen has better brightness and contrast compared to the Sony and the Canon and the difference is quite noticeable. 
The S52 is marginally larger by a few millimeter. This is a pretty huge achievement because not only the camera has a new faster processor and a few other upgrades, it also has a building cooling fan to allow unlimited recording time in all mode up to the cinema 4K resolution. Remember I said there are two reasons I believe why the top of the S52 is a bit bigger than the S5? I think the main reason is because Panasonic put a complete active cooling system there. Yes, Panasonic's engineer managed to place a cooling fan inside the area with the ventilation system to get hot air out of the camera. If you still remember a few things about physics from your school, you may remember that hot air goes up, so putting an active cooling system at the top of the camera certainly makes a lot of sense. But that really makes me wonder, why nobody has done that before? Well, I guess the reason is, there really isn't a lot of space up there. There's already the EVF, some electronic boards and wiring, so it is really quite an achievement that the engineers from Panasonic not only thought about doing that, but actually managed to fit the entire active cooling system in such a tiny space alongside the EVF. This is just such a clever design, so I won't be surprised if we start seeing cameras from other companies will have a similar cooling system design in maybe a year or two's time. The weight of this new camera is only 20 gram heavier than the original S5, which is not even noticeable. But I guess an important question is, does this new active cooling system work? Does the camera overheat? Well. I have not managed to overheat the camera at all. I did an overheat test in my room. The room temperature was around 25 to 26 degrees Celsius, which is around 78 degrees Fahrenheit. I set the camera's thermal management to high, so I can record unlimited 6K 30 video. I connect a USB PD power to the camera, so the recording won't be limited by the battery and I put in my biggest 256GB SD card into the camera. When I start recording, the back of the camera was about 30 degrees Celsius, which is 86 degrees Fahrenheit. After 30 minutes of recording, the back of the camera temperature increased to around 41 degrees Celsius, or 106 degrees Fahrenheit, and then increased to 43 degrees Celsius, 109 degrees Fahrenheit after one hour of recording. But after that, the temperature settled to around 41 to 42 degrees Celsius, that's around 108 degrees Fahrenheit. The recording stopped at 2 hour 53 minutes, and that's just because my 256 gigabyte SD card was completely filled up. At that time, the temperature of the back of the camera was still 42 degrees Celsius. So that means if I just keep swapping memory card, I probably could keep recording forever. And this is a recording at 10 bit 420 video at 6K 30 resolution internally. The camera has two SD card slots, just like the S5, so it's not one CF Express and one SD like the GH6. I've mentioned in my GH6 review that I don't really like the mixed card slot design as the camera is limited by the slower card slot. So I'm glad to see the S5 II has two identical SD card slots and they are both high-speed UHS-2 slots, so you won't get slowed down by the slower slot when you are recording to both card slots at the same time. Now, do I prefer the camera to have dual CF Express card instead? Well, I think for a camera like the S5 II, SD card probably still is slightly better for most users. However, there's a price that we have to pay for using the SD card instead of the CF Express card, and I'll talk about that very soon. There is a red LED light next to each of the SD card slot for you to see if the camera is still busy writing data onto the card. However, unlike the GH6 or the S1, the camera wouldn't make any beeping sound when the camera is still writing to the card and you open the card door. It's not that the S5 II doesn't have a little speaker to generate the beeping sound because it does beep 
when there's some other certain action that you do. So I guess the beeping sound is just one of those things that Panasonic is reserving for their flagship cameras. And to be honest, there really are not that many things that Panasonic is still reserving for their flagship camera. Even the micro HDMI port on the S5 is now upgraded to a full-size HDMI port on the S5 too. This is something that I really want, but didn't expect Panasonic would do it for the S5 too. But of course, I'm not complaining. You have the high-speed USB-C port, headphone jack, microphone jack, and a remote jack, just like the S5. By the way, Panasonic said the S5 II has a new processing engine and this is the first one that comes with the L-Square technology, which is the result of the new cooperation between Leica and Lumix. However, Panasonic has not shared any more information about what exactly is that L-Square technology. The only thing I know about this new processing engine is that it has two times signal processing speed compared to the previous engine. So earlier in the video, I said, apart from the new autofocus system, the S5 II also has two other very important changes. And one of them is the new improved in-body image stabilization system or IBIS. The original S5 has a pretty good image stabilization system. I remember when the S5 was announced, I did some comparison of the IBIS system performance between the Lumix S5 with a few other cameras, and I found that S5 video mode IBIS performance is quite a bit better than the Sony a7 III and Nikon Z6, but not quite as good as Panasonic's own S1H and GH5. But overall, S5 IBIS performance is still one of the better full-frame camera in the market. This time, Panasonic claims the S5 II has a much improved image stabilization system, which is 200% better than the S5 when recording video, and they call this new system Active IS. Now, I'm not too sure what 200% better actually mean, but the number doesn't really matter. I think most important thing is how does it perform in real life? So this time, I did some comparison with a few full-frame cameras, the original S5, Canon R6 II, and the Sony a7 IV. I've uploaded a separate video that shows you all my results in full length. But a very quick summary is, the S5 II is noticeably better than the S5. And when I compare the S5 II with the Canon R6 II, the S5 II is way better. Then when I compared it with the Sony a7 IV, the difference is so big that I actually have to recheck whether I have turned on the IBIS on the Sony a7 IV or not because the S5II's result make the Sony looks like it has no image stabilization at all. But yes, the IBIS on the Sony was turned on, it's just the S5II's IBIS is way too good compared to the Sony. Now, because of that, I then borrowed a Sony A7R5 to do more IBIS testing. According to Sony, the Sony A7R5 has a much improved IBIS system and I also saw many people say it's really good. So I thought I should just compare it against the Lumix S5 II. I know some of you may say it's not really a fair comparison as the Sony is much more expensive than the S5 II, like pretty much double the price. But I think at least it's the latest vs the latest. And it does look like the A7R5 IBIS is much better than the A7 IV. But when I do the side-by-side -side comparison with the S5 II, the S5 II's IBIS is still better. I mean, way better. When I shoot with a 18mm wide-angle lens, I can still see a bit of warping effect near the corner of the frame, but it is pretty well controlled, especially when I test it with one of the newer pre-production firmware that Panasonic sent to me just before the Christmas. So if you see some of the video that I shot or some other creator shot with a wide-angle lens when we were in Japan, those will be using an older firmware before Panasonic makes some improvement to the IBIS system. 
I guess what surprised me the most is when I compare the S5 II with the GH6, which has one of the best IBIS system that I have ever tested, partially because of the smaller Micro Four Thirds sensor is easier to stabilize. But when you compare the S5 II with the GH6, I would say S5-2's result is actually very similar, maybe even a little bit better than the GH6. There seems to be a little bit less of those sideways bouncing movement from the S5-2 compared to the GH6, so I was really surprised by that. So it does seem like this new Active IS system is indeed really good, easily the best among all the other full frame camera in the market right now and probably by quite a big margin. All those examples that I showed you before were just using the S5-2's in-body image stabilization system only. If you pair it with one of the Panasonic L-Mount lens that has the OIS, then you can have the dual IS feature, which would give you even more stabilized footage. Look at this example that I shot at the top of the Tokyo Skytree using the Panasonic 70 to 200 f4 lens at 200 mil, and you can see how stable the video footage can be, even though I was just standing there and hand holding the camera. All the testing that I showed you before was for the video mode. I also did some testing in photo mode. This time though, my result is pretty much the same as the original S5. So this is not really a big surprise because the CEPA rating for the S5-2's IBIS is still at 5 stops, which is the same as the original S5. My understanding is that the CEPA rating is only looking at the photo mode image stabilization performance. So my guess is the improvement in the image stabilization system comes with the S5-2 is only for the video mode. So that's why the CEPA rating is still the same, but its video image stabilization is so good, much better than all the other camera that some of them has much higher CPU rating. I guess one thing it teach me is reading just the numbers from a spec sheet doesn't always tell us the real performance of the camera. Next, let's talk about the video mode. With the original Lumix S5, you can capture video up to cinema 4K resolution internally. While you can record 5.9K ProRes RAW using an external recorder with the original S5, there's no 6K or 5.9K internal recording option. One big reason was that too much heat would be generated if the camera is to record this high resolution video internally. And if you know more about the engineers from Panasonic, they just would not release a camera if some certain feature can only work for like five or 10 minutes and then the camera would overheat. But now, the S5 II, because it has a new active cooling system and also with the new processor, the S5 II can record video at up to 6K resolution 30 frames per second internally, and that's 10-bit 420H265 format. You can record 6K video in the open gate format, which means pretty much the whole sensor in 3 to 2 aspect ratio, or 6K in 17 to 9 aspect ratio, or 5.9K in 16 to 9 aspect ratio. And all these are using the full width of the sensor. Well, technically, there's a very tiny crop, but we are talking about a 1% or so crop, so virtually there's no crop in the horizontal direction. Of course, you can also shoot in Cinema 4K, 4K or 3.3K or 1080p resolution. For the Cinema 4K and 4K, you can shoot up to 60 frames per second. Unfortunately, and that to me is the biggest disappointment for the S5 II, is we still have that 1.5 times crop when shooting at 50 or 60 frames per second at 4K or Cinema 4K resolution. I really hope that crop would be removed or reduced with the S5 II. So I was definitely more than a little bit disappointed when I heard the 1.5 crop for the 4K60 is still there. But to be fair, the Canon R62 is the only full frame camera in this price range that can shoot 4K60 without crop. Sony A74 and the Nikon Z62 both have the 1.5 crop for 4K60. And my understanding is that it is really just limited by the current sensor technology for a full frame sensor and this kind of specs, we still have to settle with the APS-C crop for now. 
And as mentioned before, all the recording options for resolution up to Cinema 4K has unlimited recording because of the new active cooling system. 6K, you have 30 minutes recording limit, but I was able to record almost 3 hours of 6K 30 10-bit video continuously without any sign of overheating on a 26 degree Celsius day. VDOC is already enabled out of the box and it gives you 14 plus stop of dynamic range. You can also shoot in HLG format if you want. And you can also record video in true 24 FPS now. So let's have a look at the video quality. The 6K video from the S5 II is just beautiful. It is so sharp, so clean. And if you are shooting the open gate 6K format, then you also have much more flexibility in terms of cropping. So you can crop a vertical video in pose and still maintains really good resolution and details. Cinema 4K and 4K videos are over sampled and they also look really nice as you would expect from a Panasonic camera. 1080p at normal frame rate is also very good quality, but of course, it is not quite as detailed as the 4K video when you play it on the 4K screen. If you are shooting in 1080p, you could shoot up to 180 frames per second. The image quality is still not too bad even when you are shooting at up to 150 frames per second. At 180 frames per second, there is approximately 18% crop and the image quality does seem to drop a bit. So if you want the best quality for your slow motion footage, keep it at 120 or 150 frames per second. Another thing to aware is continuous autofocus is only available up to 120 frames per second. In terms of rolling shutter, I did some side-by-side -side tests with the S5 in 4K resolution and I found the rolling shutter is pretty much the same between these two cameras. And I also tested the 6K open gate mode and I can definitely see quite a bit of rolling shutter. And let's have a look at the high ISO image quality of the 4K video record using the S5 II. From base ISO up to ISO 6400, the video footage has excellent image quality, very clean as well. From ISO 12800, we start seeing a bit of noise, especially in the shadow area. But even when we go all the way up to the maximum ISO 51200, the video quality is still pretty good. And now let's compare the S5 II with the other full frame cameras. The original S5, the Canon R6 II and the Sony A7 IV again. Even look at the video side by side, I would say the difference is very minimal between all these cameras. Even at 25,600 or 51,200 ISO, there really isn't too much difference between these cameras. It's really hard to pick which camera has the best image quality. With the S5 II, all the different format and resolution are recorded using the long gob codec, which is more efficient codec but slightly more demanding for editing and it might not give you the best result if you are shooting a scene with like millions of small things that all changes every single frame. If you want the all intra codec, you could get the S5 IIX instead, which allows you to capture video up to Cinema 4K in 10-bit 422 using the all intra codec. All these files would be quite a bit bigger, up to 800 megabit per second. One thing I want to point out is that the highest data rate formats for the S5 IIX does require you to record to an external SSD drive using the USB port. The internal SD card can only record up to 600 megabit per second. But I will talk about the S5 IIX a little bit more later on in this review. Okay, now let's have a look at the camera's photo mode. While Lumix is definitely more video focused compared to most other camera companies, photo is still a very important part in the cameras. With pretty much every new Lumix camera, there's usually some new added or improved photo features. 
With the Lumix S5 II, the full frame sensor is 24 megapixel resolution, which is the same as the original S5. Panasonic said this is a new sensor with dual native ISO, but that's all the information I received. 24 megapixel is plenty for most users, but I would be lying if I said I didn't want it to have a little bit more resolution. I think 30 megapixel would be quite nice. However, 30 megapixel is really more like a nice to have upgrade rather than something that I really need. I'm saying this because going up from 24 megapixel to 30 megapixel only equal to around 11% or so increase in linear resolution. So in practice, 24 megapixel or 30 megapixel is not really that much a difference. If you want really high resolution, the S5 II does support the multi-shot high resolution mode that generate a 96 megapixel high resolution photo in RAW or JPEG format or both. This is the same as the S5. I was hoping to see a handheld high resolution mode like the GH6. Unfortunately, we don't have that with the S5 II and you still need a tripod for that. The photo from the high resolution mode is really detailed and it also helps to keep the noise level down as well as it would also help remove some of the aliasing artifact that could otherwise appear on a normal resolution photo. The best thing about Lumix high resolution mode is the high resolution photo is created in camera. The camera would generate the high resolution RAW or JPEG automatically within 10 seconds or so after you shot the photo. To me, this is a massive advantage compared to Sony's multi-shot high resolution photo implementation which relies on the user to copy the photos to a computer and use the special software to create the high resolution photos afterwards. Not only that means there are some extra steps and you require a computer to do that, it also means you can't review the result straight away on the camera after you took the photo. With the Lumix S5 II or even the original S5, you don't have such limitation. There's now a dedicated high resolution mode on the mode dial, so it makes selecting high resolution mode a lot easier. Compared to the original S5, the high resolution mode is buried inside the menu system. One of the things the S5 II also improved is the burst speed. If you shoot with the mechanical shutter, the maximum burst speed with the original S5 is 5 frames per second if you use continuous autofocus or 7 frames per second if you use single autofocus. With the S5 II, it is now increased to 7 frames per second with continuous autofocus or 9 frames per second with single autofocus. So that's about 40% increase if you shoot in continuous autofocus mode. Not super fast, but also not bad. However, if you shoot with the electronic shutter, there's a new super high speed burst mode for the S5 II, which is 30 frames per second, no matter you use continuous autofocus or single autofocus. So that is like a 500% increase in burst speed compared to the S5 if you shoot in continuous autofocus mode. With this super high speed burst mode, you can still get the full size JPEG or RAW or both output. Another huge improvement is that the buffer size is increased from S5 24 photos if you shoot in RAW to now 200 frames with the S5 II. And unlike some other cameras which the clamp buffer size require you to shoot at the lower frame rate or some other restrictions, with the S5 II you will get at least 200 frame buffer no matter what speed or mode you shoot including the 30 frame per second super high speed burst with RAW plus JPEG output. That means if you are shooting with the mechanical shutter in continuous autofocus mode, you can shoot continuously for almost half a minute before the buffer got filled up. And even if you are shooting 30 frame per second using the electronic shutter, you can still shoot almost 7 seconds which is a lot for a camera of this price and speed. Unfortunately, one downside of having such a big buffer and using SD card instead of CF Express card is it could take quite a while for the camera to write all the photos to the card. I did a test with a 256GB SanDisk Extreme Pro 300MB per second V90 SDXC card. It took 1 minute 45 seconds to clear the 200 photo buffer when I shoot in RAW plus JPEG format. 
If I shoot in RAW only, the time decreased to 1 minute 5 seconds. It's better, but it's still quite a while. So this is definitely one big downside when you have such a big buffer and not using CF Express cards. But at least both card slots are the same speed now with the S5 too. So you won't get slowed down by one slower card slot. And you can still keep shooting and operate the camera as the camera is clearing up the buffer. Just remember, don't pull the memory card out if you see the red LED light next to the card slot is still flashing. When I was testing the autofocus and shooting some fast moving subject in burst mode, initially I was shooting using the mechanical shutter as I want to avoid rolling shutter that comes with electronic shutter. But I found the blackout time between shots caused by the mechanical shutter is really quite noticeable and makes it a bit hard for me to track a fast moving target, especially one with unpredictable movement. I switch to electronic shutter and the blackout time becomes a bit better when I shoot in AFC mode. But what I found the best is shoot in super high speed burst mode. When you're shooting in the super high speed burst mode, the camera has no blackout at all and the EVF is updated continuously, pretty much the same as if you are not taking photos. When you press the shutter button, the screen would pause for a very brief moment when the camera is preparing to start shooting. So there is a slight delay between pressing the shutter button and the camera start taking its first photo. But once the camera has start taking photos at 30 frames per second, the EVF or the LCD screen would update pretty much exactly the same way as if you were just half pressing the shutter button. I didn't notice any drop in screen resolution. Refresh rate remains the same as if you are just half pressing the shutter. The only thing that reminds you that you are actually taking photo is the red dot that is flashing at the bottom left of the display. Having no blackout really make it a lot easier for photographers to follow any fast moving subject. However, because there's no blackout to remind you that the camera is taking photos, I find the red dot flashing at the corner alone is not really that obvious when you are focusing trying to track your target. There were a few times that I thought I took some cool action sequence, but turns out I only managed to capture the beginning of the sequence because the buffer was full from the previous photo I shot and I didn't really notice that until I got home and checked the photos. So I would like to see some options available to make it more obvious when the camera is taking photo or when it stopped taking photo because the buffer is full. Maybe flashing a rectangular frame around the outside could be good or anything that is a bit more obvious obvious and let the user choose what they want, that would be great. Live view composite mode is coming back but it won't be available at launch. It's coming slightly later on by a firmware update. I love this feature on the S5 so it's great to see it's coming back. However, I don't see 4K or 6K photo mode on the camera. Panasonic also hasn't said anything about whether it's coming back by a firmware update in the future or not. But my guess is it won't come back to any Panasonic camera in the future as the burst speed of the latest camera is already so fast and that gives you RAW as well as JPEG. So the value of the 4K 6K photo mode is now really small and it's probably not worth to redevelop this feature on the new engine used by the latest generation of Lumix cameras. I'm not really sad because to be honest, I rarely use the 4K, 6K photo mode myself. However, one feature that I do hope Panasonic can bring back is the pre-burst feature from the 4K, 6K photo mode. That is the feature that the camera would take photos before you even click the shutter button. So this is one thing that I feel the S5 II could have and that would benefit a lot of photographers since there's no more 4K, 6K photo mode. The camera also has the interval shooting feature that you can use to shoot time lapse or slow motion animation. Here is a video clip that Emily, aka Michael Fawners, has shared with me that she captured using this feature with the S5 II when she was with us in Japan. So, big thank you to Emily for sharing with us this 
beautiful time lapse video. And remember to check out her channel and her S52 video contents as well. I will put a link to her channel in the video description below if you haven't already subscribed to her channel. And now let's have a look at S52's image quality and let's have a look at the JPEG first. From base ISO up to ISO 25600, the JPEGs from the S52 looks very clean and very good quality. From ISO 51200, image quality is starting to drop more noticeably. But even if you look at the shadow area, it is still quite clean and there's not much chroma noise. If you go up to ISO 102400, then you can start see some pretty noticeable chroma noise in the shadow area. If you go up one more stop to the maximum ISO 204,800, the image quality becomes quite bad, probably as expected. But is it usable? I think probably. If you just want to post on social media, at least the color information and contrast are still quite good. But if we zoom in, then definitely you can see some pretty heavy noise reduction applied to clean up the photo. Okay, next, let's compare the high ISO JPEG from the Lumix S5, S5 II with the Sony A7 IV and the Canon R6 II. Now, since the Sony A7 IV has a higher resolution 33 megapixel output, so I resample all the photos to 24 megapixel to do a more fair comparison. If you look at the JPEG that was shot at ISO 204,800, which is the maximum ISO for all these cameras, if I have to rank the JPEG from all these four cameras, I would rank the Canon number one. The Canon seems to be able to control the noise really well and yet able to retain fine details and good amount of color information and contrast. The S52 is second, mostly because it has a bit more chroma noise than the R62, but otherwise the image quality is still pretty acceptable for ISO 204800. The original S5 will be my third choice. While it retains a bit more fine details than the S5 II, it has more chroma noise. It is quite obvious if you look at the top right corner of the photo, and the contrast is also not as good as the S5 II. The Sony A7 IV will be my last choice. The contrast and the color information it managed to retain is the worst out of all four. And if we zoom in, you will see some weird color pattern that is not in all the other JPEGs. So I wonder if it's because the Sony A7 IV has a higher resolution output, which usually sacrifices the high ISO performance a little bit. Now, having said that, the difference is really not that big, especially between the Lumix and the Canon. Depends on what is more important to you. You really could say the Lumix S5 II or the Lumix S5 has the best image quality of these four. None of these ISO 204,800 JPEGs image quality is fantastic as you would expect, but even the Sony A7 IV, which I rate the worst, is still quite usable if you want to just share it on the internet. So it is pretty amazing what the latest sensor can do these days. Now, of course, comparing the ultra high ISO JPEG is only one way to compare the image quality. There are many other things like the low ISO image quality, dynamic range from the raw file, which all compare to get a full picture of the image quality. But one problem when you are testing unreleased camera is that we don't have the raw file support from our usual photo editing software. In my case, it is the Adobe Lightroom. But I managed to get hold of an early version of the Silky Pix software, which has the S52's RAW file support. So I could use it to have a play with the RAW file from the S52 and see how does it performs. Unfortunately, Silky Pix doesn't support Sony and Canon cameras. So I cannot really compare the RAW files between all these different camera using the same processing software but I could at least do some comparison with the S5. I want to see if the new sensor has any improvement for photographer, especially when handling some really high contrast scenes and need to do some extreme adjustment. Could the S5 II actually be a bit worse because of the PDAF added to the sensor? 
So I set up a high contrast scene in my room here. I use my aperture 200D and light at 100% to light up one side of the room. So it's really bright, especially I have some white color vertical blinds on that side. And then the right side of the room is in shadow and much darker. So there is a pretty high contrast in brightness between the left and right side of the photo. First, I underexpose the camera by four stops and took a photo at the base ISO using both the S5 and the S5 II. Then I push the exposure up by four stops in silky pics and export as TIFF file. Now, if I compare the TIFF file from the S5 and the S5 II, they are very similar. Not identical as I can see some minor difference. For example, if we look at the shadow area, the S5 II has a bit of green color tint while the S5 is more natural. But on the other hand, the S5 II managed to retain a bit more color information in the shadow area than the S5. So I think overall, they are pretty even with this four stop underexposed set of photo. Next, I shot another pair of photos, but this time I overexposed the photo by four stops and then recover them by applying a negative four stop adjustment in silky pics. As most of you probably know, overexposed photo is the worst thing that could happen to a raw file because once the highlight has exceeded the dynamic range that can be handled by the sensor, the highlight is scripted and you can't recover anything at all. And with this test, the result is more interesting. The overexposed raw photo from the S5 II managed to recover noticeably more highlight information than the original S5. Look at the white color blinds on the left hand side. The S5 II photo still maintains a bit of highlight details while the S5 is completely cryptid. And if you look at my gimbal and the box next to it and also my scanner that they are sitting on. Sorry, I probably shouldn't do that to my scanner. But anyway, once again, the S5 II can recover quite a bit more highlight detail than the S5. And if you look at the yellow cardboard, there is some pretty big difference between the two photos. So while the results from the underexposed test is very similar between the two cameras, the overexposed test shows us that the S5-2's new sensor appears to have quite a bit more dynamic range than the original S5 sensor in the highlight area. Now, I do want to remind you guys that the S5 II I got is running pre production firmware and the Silky Pix is also an early pre release version. I would like to play with the raw file again once Adobe released their raw support and see what sort of results that I will get. Panasonic claims the S5 II has improved rolling shutter distortion performance for the photo mode. So to see if it's really true and whether the difference is noticeable, I set up the S5 and the S5 II on a solid rig and pan the camera horizontally and shot some photos at the same time. Both cameras were set to electronic shutter and with the original S5, I keep it in the single shot mode because that is my reference point. On the S5 II, I shot in single shot mode, high speed burst mode and also the super high speed burst mode. So what I found is with the S5 II shooting in the super high speed burst mode, the roaring shutter distortion is indeed significantly less than the S5. There's still a bit of roaring shutter, but it's about half or just half the amount when compared to the Lumix S5. And this is the same when the S5 II is shooting in the high speed burst mode. The S5 II is still about half the roaring shutter, which is not bad at all. However, one thing that is interesting is, if I shoot using the single shot mode using the S5 II, then the rolling shutter appears to be identical to the S5. It seems Panasonic has applied some tricks to the burst mode to reduce rolling shutter. My guess is it's the same trick that they previously did to their 4K photo mode, but the difference is now it is applied to the full resolution JPEG and RAW output. But I do wonder if Panasonic has reduced the bit depth output when shooting in the burst mode. So when I was doing the underexposed and overexposed raw 
photo test. I also shot a few tests using S5-2's electronic shutter in the normal single shot mode and also high speed mode and 30 frames per second super high speed burst mode. As I want to see if any of these modes would give me less dynamic range or some artifacts, especially the 30 frames per second super high speed burst mode when compared to the mechanical shutter. But looking at the results, I would say I don't really see any difference with any of the photos that I shot with the electronic shutter when compared to the mechanical shutter. All the photos after some extreme exposure push and pull are virtually the same. The amount of highlight and shadow details that I can recover appears to be identical. So it means you can shoot in super high speed burst mode 30 frames per second without having to sacrifice any dynamic range. When I was finalizing the script for this review, I saw the full specs of the S5 II was just leaked. So a lot of people are talking about the face detection autofocus, the new cooling fan and other things. But one thing it seems no one has really noticed, but I think it's definitely one of the big three changes that comes with the S5 II is the new real-time LUT feature. To be fair, when I first heard of this feature, I also didn't really think much about it. But after I tried this new feature for a while now, it is easily one of my favorite new features that comes with the S5 II. And it not only just benefit videographer, but also would benefit photographer as well. What it is basically is that it allows user to apply their favorite LUT to either the JPEG or video you shot and it will bake it in. You can also preview how your LUT will look like through the EVF or the LCD screen in real time so you can see exactly how your photo or video will look like. For videographers, it means you can get your special color grading done in camera without having to do any editing yourself. This is great for professional users who need to deliver some footage to their client very quickly, but still want to have their own colors and look with their special LUT. And if you don't want to bake in the LUT because you want to do color grading in post-processing anyway, it's still a very useful feature because you can just test out some different LUTs in camera and immediately visualize what the results will look like. So you can see if the LUT works well or not before you even capture it. And once you find the LUT that would work well, you can turn off the real-time LUT feature if you don't want to bake it into your footage. And another really useful thing is if a videographer team is shooting with camera from multiple brands, then they can also apply a LUT which transform your footage to match the output from another camera. So it will make the editing and color grading workflow a lot simpler because straight out of camera, the video from your different cameras will already have the very similar colors. I'm sure there will be companies and community that will provide this kind of conversion last once the camera is released. For casual videographers who can't be bothered or don't really know how to do color grading and video editing, you can use the real-time LUT feature to apply a LUT onto your footage in camera automatically and give your footage a more cinematic look without having to do any editing. And if you are a photographer, I know a lot of photographers who usually shoot JPEG, they would prefer to shoot with a camera from a particular brand because they love, say, the Fuji colors or Olympus colors or Canon skin tone from the camera's JPEG. But with this real-time LUT feature, you can get any particular look in your camera very easily. You just need to find the LUT that will give you the look that you want. And the best thing is you can switch between different look by just a few clicks. You can have the Fuji Velvia film simulation for this photo and then the next photo you can switch to another LUT to give you say the Canon colors or maybe next one you switch back to another Fuji film simulation later on. A company called Gamut just happened to contact me and send me a few LUTs to try it out before my trip to the Lumix Summit. So when I was in Tokyo, I did quite a bit of street photography using the S5 II and I loaded some of those LUTs onto the camera to try out the real-time LUT feature with their LUTs and I just really love the results I got. Here are a few photos, all are 100% unedited, just JPEG straight out of the camera. The JPEG, I think it looks really beautiful and it has the look that I like. 
and being able to preview the result before I capture it is a big, big benefit because it means I don't really have to guess what is the best camera setting that works the best with a particular LUT. Some LUTs works better if you underexpose it a little bit and some may need you to overexpose a little bit. So usually you really need to know the LUT really well to get the best results. But since you can now preview the result in real time, so you can adjust the camera settings and immediately see how it would affect the output. And that just make it so much easier to get the perfect shot in camera. And another really cool thing is, if you are shooting RAW plus JPEG, you can reapply a different LUT in camera after you shot the photo. So maybe you were shooting a LUT that gives you the Fuji Felvia look, but later on you feel some of the portrait photo, the color looks a little bit too saturated. You can just go back to the photo on your camera and change to another LUT. All done in camera, so if you are away on holiday and you don't have access to computer, you can still play with different LUTs in camera and create the JPEG you like and then you can sync it to your smartphone using the Lumix Sync app and then post the photo onto internet to share with your friends and family without touching a computer. As far as I know, this is the first camera that provides such a cool feature. But now after playing with this feature for about a month, I do also have some thoughts about how Panasonic so I can improve this feature in the future. But to keep this review short, I talk about that in my separate video that just focus on this real-time LUT feature. I also go a little bit more in depth about this feature and show you step-by-step -step demonstration on how to use this feature. So remember to check out that video after you finish watching this review. The Panasonic Lumix S5 II uses the same BLK22 battery just like the original S5. This 2200 mAh battery appears to be the new standard battery for Panasonic as it's also the same for the GH6 and is also backward compatible with the G9 and the previous GH cameras. In terms of battery life, I find it's not bad at all. I did a 4K 24 10-bit test recording using a fully charged battery and end up I got just under 2 hours of recording before the battery dies. To be honest, if I didn't play around with some of the settings before I start recording, it could probably exit 2 hours. And for photos, one of the afternoon, I went out to test the continuous autofocus. I was mainly shooting photos in burst mode and also shot a few short video as well. I test for about 2 hours almost continuously and took more than 2600 photos and video. By the time I got home, the battery has still got more than half left. Now the actual battery life really depends on how you use it. But I remember when I was in Japan, there were quite a few days I left the hotel quite early in the morning and I got three or four battery in my camera bag. So I went out and I shoot whole day. I didn't get back to the hotel until after dinner. So I was out there for at least 12 hours and with all those days, I only need to change the battery once and that's all I need and that's enough to last a whole day. So I think in terms of battery life, it's definitely not bad at all. The USB-C port on the S5 II can also be used to charge or power the camera. If you want to use the USB to power the camera, it needs to be a PD USB supply that can deliver 9V 3 amp power. If you are a Lumix S5 owner and you have that optional vertical grip BGS5, it can also be used on the S5 II, so you can have two battery packs on the camera. Only thing that you need to aware is because the BGS5 was designed for the S5, so the joystick on the vertical grip is only a four directional one, not the new eight directional one on the S5 II's body. At the Lumix Summit, after Panasonic showed us the S5 II, at the end of the presentation, there was that. There's one more thing. And that was the S5 II X. The price of the S5 II X is 2,200 US dollar, so it's 200 dollar more expensive than the normal S5 II. S5 II X is an enhanced version of the S5 II. It has everything the S5 II has, but there are also a few extra features. It has the raw video HDMI output. It has USB SSD recording like the GH6. It has the all intra recording option. 
ProRes 422, ProRes 422 HQ recording, wireless IP streaming, USB tethering to smartphone, and also wired IP streaming. You can say S52 is a generic hybrid camera for both photographers and videographers, while the S52X is more targeting videographers that really need high quality recording or people that need to do live streaming. If you buy the normal S52, you could buy an upgrade key to unlock the HDMI raw output on your S52, but that would cost you $200 and that's the only thing that you can get. So if you think you will need the HDMI raw output, it would just make more sense to buy the S52X instead as you get quite a few more features such as the USB SSD recording, ProRes 422 recording and the different streaming options. Another difference is that the S52X has a very stealthy all black design. I saw an early display prototype in Japan and that actually looks really nice in real life. It's not just painting the Lumix logo black and change the red dial to black. The finish on the mold dial are all different and just together it just looks really cool. One thing I learned during my trip to Japan this time is that Panasonic is quite an engineering lead company when it comes to product development. For example, Yamada-san, the big boss of the Lumix, was himself an engineer before. And at all the bigger Lumix launch events, including this recent one in Tokyo, you would usually see some of the engineers also there to help answer questions. And look at the S5 too, look at the cooling system at the top of the camera. It is just a genius design and also a challenge to implement it. And I believe this is something that directly comes from the engineers. But anyway, this review has to be one of the hardest reviews that I have ever done. I don't know how long this review end up is, but my script for the review is 21 pages long. And the thing is, I still haven't talked about a lot of features that the camera can do or some of the changes. For example, all the visual assist tools for videographers like waveform, wetoscope, zebra pattern, the new 4K live cropping feature, anamorphic support, the new auto white balance lock feature, or the smaller single autofocus area point, and some other small improvement on the user menu system. But I just really have to cut them out from this review as otherwise probably no one's gonna watch the whole review. Actually, I don't really know how many of you are still watching the review up to this point. Maybe if you are still watching this review, just drop a comment below and let me know that you are still watching till almost the end of the review. But even though I cut a lot of this from my review, I know some of these things are actually very important to users. I remember when I was in Tokyo and one of the evening we were in a restaurant with a few other people. We have Kai and Locke, um, Johnny and Andrew from Panasonic. We spent probably 20 minutes talk about some of the changes in the user interface as there are just lots of little changes. Some of those changes may seem really small, but actually are very important to a user in real life. But anyway, my point is, this review may be quite long, but it is still not really that comprehensive as camera these days just have way too many features available, so I can only focus on some of the biggest changes. And to me, the three biggest changes that comes with the Lumix S5 II would be the new autofocus system, the active IS, and also the real-time LUT feature. If you are a videographer especially, you are usually just shooting by yourself and you don't have a big production team. The new autofocus systems works easily as good as any other brands. Combining that with the new Active IS, that is way ahead of all its competitors. And we also have that really clever new active cooling system. So what all this means is, the Lumix S5 II is easily one of the best full frame camera in the market for a lot of the smaller and quicker video work, run and gun style shooting, creating YouTube and social media contents. 
And if you consider the size and price of the camera, it is really the best you can buy in this price range. And the real-time LUT is just such a cool and useful feature, especially if you need to do some job that need a quick turnaround time. For photographers, the new higher resolution EVF is definitely a good upgrade. The new autofocus system is a lot more reliable, especially when you are shooting under tricky conditions. The 30 frames per second super high speed burst mode with the reduced roaring shutter is also useful if you want to shoot some fast action. The real time nut feature, again, I think is such a cool feature that I think actually benefit photographer more than videographers. While the high resolution mode is still largely the same as the original S5, it is still a very nice feature and I just love the fact that you don't have to use a computer to create a high resolution photo. And if you shoot RAW, the improved dynamic range is also a nice upgrade. So is this the perfect camera that we have been waiting for? Well, honestly, the answer is no, it's not perfect. And the reason is, perfect camera can really never exist. Perfect camera is not a fixed target that camera companies can slowly work towards. Every time a camera company releases a new camera with some cool new feature, we human would just want that feature in our perfect camera. So maybe Sony release a A7S4 tomorrow, which has some insane high ISO performance. Yes, we want that. Canon may release a R6 Mark III next month and has some crazy autofocus AI tech, whatever. And yes, we want that. Nikon now has the in-camera video raw recording. And of course, yes, we want that in our perfect camera. But at the same time, we want the camera to be maybe as small as um, Fuji Frame X100, priced probably around the S5 because the price is pretty good, and it can't overheat even when you're shooting 6K under the sun. So the definition of perfect camera is changing every month, and of course, it's different from people to people. So even if we could get the engineers from all the camera companies to work together to combine the technology to create our perfect camera, it's still not going to happen with the price, spec and size that we want. With the Lumix S5 II, yes, I want 4K 120, I want handheld high resolution mode, but realistically, the thing that I really want is uncropped 4K 60. Unfortunately, we don't have it, but that is pretty much the only big thing that I want, but that is missing from the camera. There are definitely a lot of smaller things that the camera can improve, like a wider range of object detection. I would like the rolling shutter in video mode to be a bit less. There are some other improvements that can be made to the real-time LUT feature, which I'll talk about in the separate video. But most of these things are just nice to have improvements, certainly not deal breaker to me. To me, the biggest thing about this Lumix S5 II is, with the new hybrid autofocus system, the S5 II is now a really solid all-round camera with no major weakness. It does photo well, it does video well, and it offers so many features or features that it just does better than its competitors. And once you also consider the camera's price, I think the S5 II is the most perfect camera you can buy in the market right now. And this is probably the most perfect, most versatile camera that I have ever tested or personally used since I started this channel. And if you are my regular viewer, you know I don't say things like this very often. This is not a perfect, perfect camera, but it's pretty damn close. And once again, if you enjoyed this review, I will really appreciate if you can like this video, drop a comment or share this video to support me. And remember to check out my other S5 II videos on this channel as well. The 1428mm, now at 28mm. And now, switch to 14 wheel.